Great. Um, so like I said, my name is Maddie. I use she, they pronouns. Um, and I'm just absolutely thrilled over the moon to be joining in conversation with these incredible panelists that we have today um, to talk about um, this important conversation. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to go over a few um, reminders about accessibility and kind of how we have the Zoom set up for our participants today. So first, um, for accessibility reasons, um, please, uh, for our panelists, please say your name as you begin speaking. Um, this helps with a variety of language things and it also helps with captioning um, people who have English as a second language. I mean, we wanna be respectful um, and make sure that this content is as accessible as possible for all participants. Um, so what that might be, like I started, uh, when I introduce myself, I'll say, this is Maddie, and then continue with my thought in response to maybe something is saying or a question. The second thing um, is to please speak at a reasonable pace, um, an accessible pace for our wonderful ASL interpreters. Um, they're joining us today um, to help bring language access to all folks here. And um, I want to ensure that we make make sure that this is reasonable for them to effectively communicate the information that we're presenting to all people. A couple of things regarding how the Zoom is set up. If you have questions throughout the panel for our panelists, um, you can send those using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, so depending on how wide your screen is, it may show up right at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or you might have to click on the three dots that say more and click on Q&A in order to send us a question. Um, we will take some time at the end of the webinar to answer those questions. Additionally, um, we do have our chat open. However, the chat works one way. Um, so if you have an accessibility barrier or if you have a question or concern unrelated to the content of the webinar, please send a chat in the webinar chat itself. Either way, if you send a Q&A or if you send a chat, we'll be sure to see it. Um, so don't worry if you get those mixed up either way, we'll see it and we'll, we'll ensure that will help. Um, additionally, just as a reminder, this is being recorded um, and this will also be available later this week or early next week on Disability Rights Florida's YouTube. Um, so if you wanna rewatch it, if you wanna share it, um, provide it to someone who couldn't attend, it will be available to you and we will post it on the Disability Rights Florida social media and website uh, once it's on YouTube. Last, um, I wanted to note something from our partners at NDRN. Um, Jack Rosen, who works for our membership, men, sorry, membership associate association, the National Disability Rights Network is hoping to do interviews with trans folks with autism to weave into a documentary short he's producing on the attacks on gender affirming care targeting people with disabilities. So far, two states have laws on the books reg regarding and specifically targeting access to care for folks with autism, as well as certain mental health disabilities such as depression. In particular, he is hoping to connect with folks who left states that restrict access to care. The film would attempt to debunk these attacks as nothing more than attempts to restrict access to care that are using disability um, as a way to highlight the importance of solidarity between the disability and LGBTQ communities. This would be, this uh, film would be informed and centered disability justice. Jack is based in the DC area and he drives and is able to travel 
within that area to conduct interviews. He also is occasionally in New York and South Florida and would be potentially able to travel to those locations for interviews. If that's something that folks are interested in, please uh, send us a chat or contact Jack Rosen um, at the National Disability Rights Network. So now that I have gone through my whole spiel and talked a whole lot, I am so excited to now really get into um, our conversation today. And again, I'm so honored to share space with people I have looked up to for such a long time. Some of the leaders in this field, um, we really have such a stellar group of panelists here today. Um, and I really hope folks enjoy. So to get started, I'd like each panelist to introduce themselves. Um, if comfortable, um, share your name, pronouns, a brief visual description, a little bit about maybe where you work or what your advocacy looks like, and any other important information you'd like to share with people who are here today. And just a reminder to please say, this is so-and-so when you introduce yourself. Hey everyone, this is Catherine Perez and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am a light-skinned Latina woman um, with short brown hair and I wear glasses and um, I'm sitting on a couch with like a gray background wearing like a black and white shirt. Um, oh, I was brave to go first and now I'm forgetting all the cues, but oh, let's see um, my introduction. So I am the director of the Coelho Center, which is C-O-E-H-L-O, -E Coelho Center for Disability Law, Policy and Innovation at Loyola Law School. And I also am a visiting professor of law at Loyola Law School, where I teach disability rights. Um, I am a member of the California Bar, so I'm technically an attorney, but I really am non-practicing in a traditional sense. I do more policy work. Um, I also am engaged in academic work. Um, I'll be getting my PhD in disability studies uh, this year, finally, um, you know, which is exciting. We're not celebrating just yet, but... We're almost there, almost. Um, so I identify as a queer disabled Latina. Um, my grandparents uh, immigrated from Mexico. And um, yeah, I, I often identify as queer, but I also identify as pansexual as well. Um, and the disabled part, uh, and maybe I could talk about this a little bit later as well. Um, I have a number of psychiatric disabilities. Um, and yeah, I think my um, intersecting identities and the intersection oppression that I experience um, makes me in a way um, an expert in this space. But otherwise, I'm a little bit intimidated to uh, be in the presence of folks who I know uh, have much more expertise. Um, I think the areas that I am involved with most are in higher education, specifically getting more people with disabilities into legal education and uh, the legal profession. And I do um, a lot of coalition and policy building work around um, the intersection of immigration and disability. Um, but thank you for including me. I'm I'm happy to be here. Sure, I'll go next. Thank you for being the brave one. Uh, uh, my case, I'm Victoria Rodriguez Roldan. I am uh, currently the coordinator for state autism strategy for the state of Maryland. Uh, reappointed by the governor to this position by Governor Westmore on uh, August 28th uh, of this year. I am Puerto Rican, Latina, black hair. I'm wearing giant pink, head pink headphones uh, with a microphone, wearing a brown blazer. 
and I would say uh, I'm autistic myself. I'm I'm a trans woman, and previously I did lead. Uh, I have worked ex almost exclusively in either LGBTQ policy or disability policy, at either leading the Disability Justice Project, the National LGBTQ Task Force, for five years, and then. Uh, and leaving the policy department at Glisten, working education policy there. Uh, I am a lawyer by training, so I've never practiced a day in my life, and I am almost proud of that at this point. Uh, you know, I seem to have been fortunate in that sense. Uh, I have myself a fair amount of mental health disabilities, and I'm surrounded on my side by medication bottles. I keep them next to me so I can consult a spreadsheet on the computer when I take them oh, so I don't forget. It's kind of sad in a way. Uh, but I would say between the expertise that comes with that intersectionality, which has been my focus, uh, and currently in my back to government role because I, I started in government and hated it. And nowadays I'm back in government 10, 10 years later and somehow liking it. I would say the goal is to make Maryland a lead, the leader because it's currently there's no such other position in any other state like mine. At least it's created by the legislature. So the goal would be to try to create a plan as a policy that establishes a very inclusive role that acknowledges that autistic people are LGBTQ, are people of color, are queer, and I can keep on going. But yeah. I hope I didn't forget the cues. I'll go next if that's okay. Um, this is Marenike, um, Marenike Gable and I woo. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and or they, them. And um, I am a non-binary um, um, black African woman, um, assigned female at birth. So I'm dark skinned. Um, I am wearing a um, my micro braid wig today and some uh, like a black scarf and a black shirt. My background is blurred, um, but I'm in my bedroom and I have a stimming device in my hands. Um, I'm really um, pleased to go after my two colleagues um, who, you know, you know, we share being, you know, people of color who are disabled, who are queer, who are really passionate about working in this space. Um, for me, it kind of have a range of you know, different types of work. Um, I consider myself an activist scholar, um, but, you know, you know, globally, I am a research fellow at um, Drexel University, and um, I work, I do um, diversity um, on equity and um, representation and justice work with um, autistic women and non-binary network, but I also do some freelance things with other organizations, and um, I'm just very passionate about um, disability justice, about intersectionality, um, about um, like neurodiversity affirming work, and really just addressing some of these um, unnecessary silos that we create for ourselves um, in the work that we have when there's so much, you know, that we're, there's so much that's interconnected about our communities um, that it really isn't, it doesn't help us to be, you know, divided. So this, you know, panel today, you know, here, you know, whether it's from a you know, professional standpoint or here, you know, personally, um, as a person, as a parent, um, as, you know, a member of the community, um, this is just something that's really, just really crucial. And I'm just really grateful for the conversation that we're going to have today. Um, hi, I'm Claudia Center. I'm the legal director at Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. I'm so um, happy to be with my colleagues here today on this important topic. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a white middle-aged woman with brown hair um, uh, in my living room um, in San Francisco. Uh, I have uh, friends and family members, um, both um, youth and adults who are trans people who have disabilities other than any gender dysphoria um, and 
am very passionate about this issue and completely agree with what Marenike just said about silos. And, and I think we're starting to get better. And, um, you know, this, this gathering is, um, you know, a step toward our, um, our collaboration. Hello, uh, this is Simone Chris. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of the Transgender Rights Initiative at Southern Legal Council. Um, we're based in Gainesville, Florida, but we do statewide work. Uh, I'm a white, cisgender, uh, gay woman, identified as lesbian. Um, I'm wearing a black suit with a progress pride flag lapel pin. I'm at my office because this is where I live. If you ask my wife, she will attest to that. Uh, my office is very messy. Um, so happy to be with you all today. Um, I am a, a civil rights attorney and I really have, have specialized and focused on transgender rights uh, work and I utilize federal impact litigation to challenge state laws and policies that impede access to justice for, for trans folks. Um, we do disability rights work as well. That is not my you know, area of expertise, but it is an area that Southern Legal Council has historically really intentionally focused on. Um, we also do work around the criminalization of homelessness. And as everyone is aware, all of these areas have so much intersection and overlap that, that you know, they really aren't separate areas of law. Um, right now I'm leading multiple federal lawsuits against the state of Florida. Um, for the anti-trans laws and policies that have passed recently, particularly those that have, have stripped access to medically necessary gender affirming care for trans folks, um, those that create unsafe spaces for LGBTQ youth in schools, uh, et cetera. So I'm sure we'll get more into that a little bit later, but um, so good to be here with you all. Thank you. Wow, this is Maddie. I just want to say, like, I'm just so speechless and like honored to share space with y'all and yeah, y'all, y'all's work and y'all's ability to show up today and give your whole selves this conversation. I just truly appreciate um, all that y'all are bringing, and um, I look forward to getting into the conversation with you all as well. Um, just to start, I I do already like appreciate all of the kind of themes we're talking about, how all of these things are intersecting. And that's that's kind of the main point of this conversation is that we need to address these histories and address our shared experiences so that we can move forward and build solidarity and work better together. Um, I think each of you touched on that in your introductions, and I think that is such a good foundational thing that participants can hold with them as we continue throughout the webinar and conversation. Um, additionally, I think just as a starting point for those who may not be familiar with some of the topics um, we're gonna talk about today, I believe we have a poll that I'm going to launch. Um, if folks who are participating can reply to this poll, I'd be really interested to understand what your familiarity with today's topic is. Um, so very familiar, somewhat familiar, unfam somewhat unfamiliar, um, and very unfamiliar. And so far we're leaning more towards being somewhat familiar, having some familiarity with uh, the topic. Okay. Um, okay, awesome. For time's sake, I'm going to end the poll so we can get into some of the questions. Um, but overall, uh, folks are very familiar or somewhat familiar, which is good to keep in mind as we continue the conversation um, throughout the webinar. But I just wanted to note as a starting point, 
um, you know, a great way to kind of ground this conversation is the idea of ableism um, being more than just discrimination against folks with disabilities. Uh, it's a system of oppression that decides what bodies and minds and functions are best under capitalism and kind of what the idea of what is the ideal body, right? And I think when you think about ableism in that way, kind of considering who best can walk, talk, work, etc., cetera, um, it's, it's easy to, um, it's easy to begin to see how these things overlap and are able to um, kind of feed into other uh, systems and, and marginalization. So just wanna kind of keep that in mind um, that we should kind of continue to kind of keep that to ground us and to in order to think about what ableism is as a foundational oppression that decides who is and isn't normal and that um, is seen throughout all um, discrimination of folks. Um, so with that kind of frame in mind, I'd love to kind of jump into the thick of the conversation with our panelists um, and kind of get at the, start with really getting at the main part of the conversation, which is, this is a big question, but it's like we mentioned, it's kind of hard to tease it out as individual things. So. Uh, are we able to provide a historical context that has led to the division between the disability and LGBTQ communities in the medical and legal sphere? So when you think about things like the Americans with Disabilities Act or uh, the DSM, the Psychiatry um, Diagnostic uh, Manual, um, how do our current legal and medical frameworks kind of contribute and continue this division? Um, and are there any specific ways that y'all would want to highlight um, maybe specifically about the ADA or those diagnoses or, or other legal or medical precedents that I haven't yet named? Um, this is Claudia. I just want to acknowledge um, that uh, you know, the, the roots of the siloing is, from my point of view, is really from transphobia in the disability community and ableism in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and so, uh, you know, I recently went back and read the hearing transcript from 1989 when um, trans people were excluded um, from the ADA or, or were the effort was to exclude trans people from the ADA. Um, we've we've kind of had some success in pushing back on this um, in the courts in recent years. And, um, you know, I think that that's a really low point in disability history that that happened. I don't know that we could have prevented it. Um, I wasn't there, but I mean, I think we could talk about it more. We could apologize. We could, you know, say that was really awful um, what happened that day and that the law excludes people on its face who are trans. I mean, I would say I want to attest to not just the topic of transphobia and homophobia within the disability community, because for many years, the disability rights movement has been essentially pale, stale, and male, basically. It has, and the perception that we get, like, of the disabled, of the ideal disabled person is essentially the photogenic white person in a wheelchair, extra bonus points if they're male, and if we can find a gay male, then we, yay, we're very diverse, uh, and we all give ourselves a gold star for it. Uh, I love how Miranda K is, is nodding along, like, yeah. Uh, but uh, I would say that, and this is Victoria, by the way, sorry. I would say that <clears throat> I also want to attest to the problem of ableism within the LGBT community, which is that as, as attorneys started getting into the idea of using the ADA for gender dysphoria, 
and I'm not going to go too deep into the legal judo involved in getting around the exclusion in, uh, because it's kind of an interesting set of arguments. But what I would definitely say is that there was a whole lot of resistance along the lines of, oh, we don't want to be like those people. And as recently as a couple of years ago, you have the whole argument of, oh, being trans is sentimental illness, basically, which for me creates the answer of, it's not, you're correct, but why are you feeling the urge to, in, to yell so hard that you're not mentally ill? What does that say about how you perceive mental illness and whatnot? So that's where I would start off. And honestly, I would also add, and by the way, if any litigant wants to hear me, uh, the idea of trying to oppose um, the various uh, tra uh, uh, transition-related care bans using the ADA, that's an idea. I'm just tossing it out there. If you can find a judge that will hear you, you know, all the more power. Uh, but what I would say in that sense, it's essentially, it goes back to 1990. And like Claudia said, I wasn't there either. I was born in 89, so I was probably pooping on a diaper uh, uh, on a crib, trying to figure out how to stand up when that happened. But honestly, it's not... Uh, it, it created the wedge where the disability movement was already showing what what moral compromises it was willing to make. And in the, the, the HIV AIDS movement of the time, which was peak epidemic, uh, had to fight really hard not to get excluded from it, which we do see in the Jesse Holmes and Tom Larkin transcripts of the of that day, which Claudia sent me. We're working on a on a paper, and I just it reminded me of how much I hated Jesse Holmes. But could someone? This is Maddie. Could someone elaborate a bit more about? Jesse Helms and the ADA and, and how that all came to be and uh, explain the ADA and and um, talk a little bit about it being trans exclusionary for those who might not be familiar with law. I'm trying to figure out which one of us should go first. Claudia, you yeah. were doing that research recently, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, there was a sort of right wing attack on the bill that eventually became the ADA beginning in 1989, um, saying that because the ADA was using the term mental impairment, that that meant that anything in the DSM at the time, I think it was DSM three, um, could be covered by the ADA. So then the the right wing would pull out the DSM and read, you know, every horrible, you know, from their, some of them are horrible, you know, sort of the things that are, you know, like pedophilia or things that are crimes if they're acted upon. Um, so started putting those in the record um, as this is what the ADA would cover. And so then um, in order to, to get the ADA through the house and then through the Senate as well, um, there was an agreement of a list of um, disorders from the DSM that would not be co covered. So it was things like pedophilia, exhibitionism, kleptomania, um, and included was, um, these are old fashioned words, transvestism, transsexualism, and um, gender identity disorders, um, not resulting from a physical impairment is is what was ultimately agreed on. And so as a result, you um, it, it's very difficult to be covered by the ADA solely based on transgender status, even if the person needs accommodations in school related to accessing care or accessing bathrooms or this comes up a lot in, prisons and jails, 
Um, so, so now because the DSM has changed so much and now there are different terms and different analysis of, of, um, of what trans means in terms of the DSM. And now we talk about gender dysphoria. Some of the courts are saying that those exclusions don't um, apply to the modern era. I just want to chime in um, because there's so much that can be said about this, but um, just to kind of build up on something that um, um, Victoria mentioned a, a little earlier about, um, you know, how this also intersected with um, some of the in the HIV stigma of the time. And um, I want to share like, you know, all of these things have roots, you know, they, you know, and though people might want to box disability here and, you know, um, queer identity here or whatever here. None of these, these things don't, they intersect. Um, they cannot be boxed. Um, they're not going to stay in the boxes. And so um, one example, you know, that I'd like to give is, you know, in order, you know, the, you know, you know, HIV AIDS were, you know, was technically covered under the ADA, but some of the ways that the compromises that were made again, because of some of these things that were shared were that we we obtained a huge slew of HIV criminalization laws. Okay, okay, well, if we're going to have to cover these people or help them or support them or accommodate them or provide, you know, as we saw with the pair of last resort with the Ryan White Care Act and so forth, then we need to also make sure that they're not spreading their disability, their, their ickiness, you know, to, um, <laughs> to the rest of us, because then those are people who are at the, you know, the dreaded intersection of both being disabled and typically, you know, often at the time perceived as queer. So, you know, to currently we still have, you know, more than 34 states, um, as well as jurisdiction with a number of HIV specific criminalization laws that are very archaic and don't match up to the science. Um, and then we have a number of states that can basically, you know, like amplify or supercharge their laws with the existing laws, even if they don't have specific statutes against it. So we see that it's almost been like, you know, okay, we're not going to cover this. We're not going to cover this. We're not going to cover this. Or we're going to cover this, but we're going to do this. It's like from the beginning, exclusion was, was kind of built in um, just to convince um, you know, just to kind of get things through. And so while I'm grateful for the ADA, you know, there are many holes, you know, that exist as a result, uh, you know, a lot of compromises that were made as a result. I would just point out a favorite hole that I like to point in the ADA that people often ignore is the weakening of application for it to drug addiction. Catherine, you haven't spoken, please. I don't want to, us to take the whole monopoly and making fools out of ourselves in front of a crowd. You should partake too. Yeah, this is Catherine. Um, no, I'm just waiting for further questions. I feel like that was good comprehensive background. I'm interested maybe, um, I, I wanted to call on Simone to see, because I know part of this question is, how does our current legal and medical frameworks continue to contribute to this division? So. Um, I'm interested as to your work in this space. Yeah, this is Simone. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of tension right now in in how to best go about utilizing the tools that we have at our disposal in terms of federal laws to protect the rights of LGBTQ folks um, and the folks that live at the the intersection of of LGBTQ identities and and folks with disabilities. And I think it's it's hard for a lot of reasons, um, some of which are just like disagreements around the, you know, pathologizing, I can never say that word, like inappropriately pathologizing gender identity and, and variance in gender, uh, but also needing and wanting to, to fit in, it fit, fit under and, and have the protections of the laws that protect on the basis of disability. Um, and then, you know, you look at the way that the other side is sort of weaponized in the way that they've always done against marginalized communities. They've weaponized, you know, the, the gender dysphoria diagnosis and, and, and the sort of sometimes co-occurrences of gender dysphoria and autism and other things like that to deem, you know, transgender folks and particularly transgender minors 
um, incapable of providing consent, incapable of providing assent, incapable of understanding the consequences of treatments that that are can be life saving and and, and life affirming. Um, and so there's just so many elements and so many pieces that it it's uh, it's a scary world to be litigating in right now, and it's a scarier world to be living in, especially in states like Florida, where it seems like every day there's a new law criminalizing the existence of of trans folks. Um, but yeah, I think that when we look at historically, like the way that fear and misinformation and stereotypes and prejudice have been weaponized against these communities, it's, it just seems like, how, how have we not learned? How have we, how do we keep repeating these mistakes over and over and over in the year 2023? Um, and I, I, I hear what was said earlier about, you know, you using the ADA um, in cases like the ones I'm litigating right now against the DeSantis administration in the state of Florida, um, criminalizing gender affirming health care. And it's just, it's, it's hard to bring, you know, cases of first impression and novel legal theories in, in a normal world. And we are not living in a normal world right now. And we have such a hostile judiciary that, you know, we're, <laughs> we're fighting for our lives to have sex discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause, which so plainly and clearly includes discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. It, it's not, there's no question. And now we're being subject to rational basis and having to prove invidious discrimination to, to, to survive these in, in these courts. And it's just, it's such a hostile environment we're litigating in and living in. I don't know if that answered your question, but <laughs> there's just so much. Yeah, and I appreciate you kind of tying, you know, these foundations into the work that you're currently doing, Simone, because I was hoping that you could speak a bit more to that. And also, um, you know, for all folks that have been involved in some of this intersectional casework, litigation work, just and and in understanding kind of these developing and novel legal theories, um, you know, what, what kind of work are we seeing at this intersection? You know, how has disability and LGBTQ inter, like intersecting discrimination affected people with disabilities um, who are LGBTQ at a variety of places in their life? I'll, like be it like you were mentioning earlier, healthcare, maybe education, employment, incarceration, transportation, just to name, you know, a couple spheres of how we can view law and, and people's experiences. Um, and I know um, Claudia has some experience in, in, in the advocacy that uh, she's done through DREDF. Um, I know, Simone, like you mentioned, you're doing um, some good work as far as, um, you know, starting starting next week, actually, the, the advocacy you're doing um, in Florida. So, um, yeah, if folks could speak a bit to the different um, things they've been involved in or just their knowledge of how these things have shown up in the legal um, realm. I'll just quickly note that, so when I started doing transgender rights work and really stepped into this space, uh, it was due to just an, an overwhelming need, a dearth of access to legal representation for the trans community. There just weren't people doing this work in Florida. Um, it has obviously become, <laughs> I had no idea what, I was, what, what, was, what was coming in the next few years when I started doing this work in 2016. Um, and it's become so much more of, like the, 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 there are active laws seeking to strip rights from, from this community and, and sort of erase them in a way that we didn't see previously. But, but one thing that I found to be a really, a really helpful tool and technique that, that I used and that I trained lots and lots of other attorneys on um, back before this, you know, really just multifaceted all out attack on trans lives um, was utilizing some of the, the special education laws, for example, um, in representing trans kids in schools. And so, you know, there were many unspoken, unwritten, or sometimes spoken and written policies that excluded transgender youth from the bathrooms that aligned with their gender identity, um, that, that didn't allow them to use the name and pronouns that align with their gender identity. 
um, and, and just that created an unsafe environment in which they weren't able to focus on education and academics they were, or, or socialization or what, everything that school is supposed to be because they were too worried about not drinking water because they didn't want to use the bathroom. Um, and that's just a, one tiny example of the like myriad ways in which their experiences were, were impeded by these discriminatory policies. Um, but I was able to really effectively for many years use Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the IDEA to build in accommodations in these kids' special education plans that otherwise I really didn't have a good legal remedy to, to seek that, those, th their ability to access an affirming learning environment. And so I think that's just a tangible example of how, you know, we, we sort of use the, these, the, it, how folks who are living at the intersection of these identities, um, we can really look at what tools are available on this side that, that you know, discuss sex discrimination and what tools are available over here that, that have disability related discrimination or protections and how can we best utilize those um, to, to, to protect folks. And so that's just a, one example. Um, this is Claudia. I think we're looking at the same thing um, in terms of people who are either in um, states with gender affirming care bans um, or in areas that have very little gender affirming care. So if you look at healthcare and you look at transportation, those are two sectors that are extremely ableist and extremely transphobic. So with the um, trans bans, um, we're now having people not only have to fight all the existing barriers to healthcare that they were already fighting, but now having to, to, um, to travel. And you know, we know travel's not accessible either. And, and so um, we're trying to, to brainstorm and figure out how to support people in their travel um, and also uh, how to make sure people have access to healthcare, that it's accessible, that there's plain language, that there's exam tables that are accessible, that there's ASL in medical care and so on and so on and so on. This is Veronica. I just wanted to quickly jump in about something that Simone mentioned earlier related to um, how this goes back to our youth and like this, you know, the, you know, how this we see this with, you know, idea and section 504, like, it, you know, like this is all kind of like intertwined. And, you know, I just was thinking we're talking about, you know, cases and I'm just thinking about Kincaid versus Williams and the situation with, you know, Keisha Williams. Um, and but but, you know, in terms of being, you know, forced to be, you know, housed with males being called, you know, being misgendered and being denied care for the crime of not having bottom surgery, you know, because everyone doesn't isn't necessarily going to, you know, that's not what uh, determines one's gender. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, you know, ironic, but not really that this happened in Florida, you know, in Fairfax County of all, I mean, sorry, in Virginia, I'm sorry, Fairfax County of all places, you know, where, which for a number of years has been essentially the, um, you know, textbook, you know, you know, definition of the pre-K to prison pipeline, you know, for students, you know, and particularly for black and brown disabled students, you know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, the, just the whole thing of, again, how does it impact someone in their youth to not drink water and not eat and not this so that you don't have to use the restroom and so forth, um, only to go into adulthood, identify the way you're allowed by law and still be denied because that's not really a disability need. You know, all of these things that people are addressing, they're, they're, it starts, you know, these issues are impacting adults, but it's starting very young. It's starting to impact people, you know, at the, at, the, at the very young ages when they're already disenfranchised. And that's, you know, and again, about not allowing people to, to give consent or believing them capable of assent because of their disability and their age. When you look at that um, layered combination, you just get, you know, it's just, it, 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 it's devastating. For those who um, are joining us today who are un, 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 unfamiliar with 
uh, the Williams versus Kincaid case, like you just uh, were referencing, Marini K, could could y'all talk a little bit about that and talk a bit about how um, that was really important when it came to understanding gender dysphoria under the ADA and kind of was one of the one of if not kind of the first big cases that addressed this intersection. I actually love for one of my colleagues to describe it because I, um, being a, a non-attorney, I don't think I'm going to use the right, I'm going to do it all layperson language. <laughs> and so I would really want to kind of someone to hit in on some of those key points. Um, this is Claudia. I haven't looked at that case in a while, but um, as I recall, um, the question was whether gender dysphoria could be considered a disability under the ADA, even though, like we talked about a few moments ago, the ADA excludes a number of, um, uses the words transsexualism, transvestism, however you say that, and um, gender identity disorders not um, resulting from physical impairment. And so, um, in the trans slash disability advocacy world, there were sort of two ideas about how to get around the um, ADA exclusions. One was to talk about, you know, that these terms are not even up to date anymore, that now we talk about gender dysphoria and how um, gender affirming care is one way to um, treat and mitigate gender dysphoria. And so it's a different model. So that's one um, way to get around the exclusions. Another way that people um, talked about was um, a constitutional law theory that this exclusion, there was no rational basis for it. There was no um, reasoned basis for it, that it was really just a desire to harm trans people. And that if you, you know, go back and look at um, some of the um, case law around um, um, gay and lesbian people, uh, I forget the name for the um, case out of Arizona, where it was deemed a bare desire to harm that you couldn't have local ordinances to help queer people. And that oh, was struck right. down. Romer B. Evans. I Thank think. you, Romer B. Evans. And um, so there was the idea, this was like a bare desire to harm trans people to cut them out of this law. But in the end, people really went more with the um, first argument I talked about, um, the, that the DSM had changed and our views had changed. And I believe that's how it was allowed to proceed in the Kincaid case, that that you know those terms that were excluded are no longer even what we're talking about. So um, the the condition or the disability is not excluded. Um, someone wrote asked about Section fifteen fifty seven of the ACA. I think there are a few cases that use 1557 to try to get, you know, coverage for gender affirming care. Um, I read one recently. Um, I'm not enough of an expert to tell you, um, you know, what are all the 1557 um, trans cases out there, but it, but it is being used by advocates. Yeah, that was one of, I'm sorry, this is Simone, Chris. Um, that was one of the claims that we went on in our case called Decker v. Weta, challenging the state of Florida's ban on gender affirming care being covered uh, for all Florida Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, we did the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution, the uh, 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, and the Medicaid Act. And we were we were successful on each of those claims after a two week trial and the other cases that have also utilized uh, section fifteen fifty seven of the Affordable Care Act for this type of discrimination have been um, the Fain case in West Virginia, the Flat case in Wisconsin, the Cato case I believe in North Carolina, um, and then I think Boyden in Wisconsin. So it, it is being used. Um, it's. I haven't had as much luck or not, I guess not luck. I haven't had great success, unfortunately, with utilizing like having individuals go through the process of filing um, 
complaints with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under 1557 and having any sort of remedy reached that way, but but it has been a successful tool um, for coverage, not necessarily the criminalization of the provision of care or bans on the provision of care, but for the coverage of care um, in, in federal litigation. This is Maddie. Thank you all so much. Um, I feel like the lawyers watching this are like <laughs> writing this down in their notes because um, this is such good info. And as a non-lawyer and, you know, not even remotely, uh, I feel like sometimes understanding of all the legalese, um, it's always uh, incredible to hear hear y'all speak through this and, and help y'all um, and give people the tools to do this work really well. Um, in case there's uh, an ability to kind of shift the conversation a bit to talk about policy, because um, I know some of us on the call are more policy wongs, and I know there's people um, attending that are more policy rather than uh, legal practitioners. Um, what kind of disability and LGBTQ related policies um, are we seeing across the country um, regarding um, the intersection between those two and, and that are targeting the disability and uh, trans and LGBTQ communities um, in, in their efforts. feel like this one's more Catherine and I, to an extent, but <clears throat> I would say as far as priorities, uh, it is primarily the issue that, like, we need to start encouraging laws that affirm at uh, least disability access to uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought because I just have to get up and feed the dog. Uh, she's a hound dog and she's loud. But what I would say, at least in my case, I'm trying to make it an affirmative essence that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have access to LGBT inclusive education, have access to reproductive health care, have access to transition related care. But I do have the benefit of working this in a pretty liberal state. So yeah. Could anyone, this is Maddie, could anybody speak to how, if there's specific examples of how um, the policies like Victoria was just talking about um, maybe could help bridge the gap between the disability communities and, and offer some, like create those policies that are affirmative of both disability and or LGBTQ identities. Also feel free to answer any of the questions at any time. This is Claudia. Um, we've been thinking about this a lot in um, in California, not only about gender affirming care, but also um, uh, abortion access. And if people are are having to come to California for either information or care, then it better be accessible. Um, and I kind of referenced that before about, you know, plain language and, and captioning and ASL and exam tables. And, um, you know, some people use support people when they go get care. Um, so we want to include support people. And if there are abortion funds or trans funds for people, um, we're going to need to put aside um, more money for people who have to travel who are disabled because it's going to be more expensive. Yeah. 
to chime in quickly, this is Miranda Kay on that, um, in addition to, you know, the issue with, with transportation, with um, cognitive accessibility, um, and so forth. I think that there's also a need to, you know, have like practical, culturally affirming, you know, practices built into these things as well. Um, and so that's something that you would hope one would think to do so, but it's not necessarily the case. And so thinking about the heterogeneity, geneity, I'm sorry, of our, of the community, of both, you know, of, of you know, these communities, um, ensuring that um, can you um, address individuals for whom English is not, you know, their, um, you know, primary language or for whom, you know, or individuals for whom there are certain, you know, practices that would be more, you know, that, you know, more suitable, you know, that, that need to be done in a different way to, you know, again, be affirming of cultural, or, you know, background and ethnicity and so forth. Moving into, apologies, this is Maddie. Moving into another part of our questions um, for y'all today. Um, kind of thinking, you know, we've talked a little bit about the legal aspect, the policy aspect, how medicalization has, has played a big role in this. Um, this has also had a direct impact um, on the communities themselves and community members and how they view disability, how they view trans folks, how they view um, LGBTQ folks, et cetera. Um, could y'all speak a bit to the impact um, that has had, that, that like all of these various factors has had on individuals themselves and kind of speaks to the need for this conversation to happen by itself? This is Marina Kay. I'm just going to say it's hard to know where to start because <laughs> it's like such a big mess. <laughs> um, you know, when you, you know, I just think about like the sense of, of defeat and hopelessness that exists within the community, you know, particularly among our, our, our youth. Um, this sense of where is it safe to go and what, you know, so we, we already know that, you know, within the, you know, LGBTQI, you know, plus communities, you know, there's a higher incidence of, of disability, of, you know, acquiring disability if one does not have one. Um, we know that there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of information about the disparities in healthcare, which contribute to disability. So there's all of that aspect. Um, there's not getting the fact that if you're disabled, you're typically not getting the, you know, you know, as you age, you're not getting the type of care that's, may, you know, maybe centered toward your needs. You're not getting, you know, like accessible sexual education or even being seen as a sexual being. If you're queer, you may not be getting information that's relevant to you, um, you know, in, you know, in a, you know, cis heteronormative, you know, kind of like system um, in terms of what's given in the public schools and so forth. So there's all of these areas where you already may not get the care that you need or when there may only be certain providers in certain areas that, you um, you know, um, who can't treat everyone. Um, you know, again, the issue of travel. So there's all of that. And then there's, you know, the unaddressed mental health piece um, and, you know, these all of these attacks on, you know, services and service providers. How on earth, you know, like what, how, I'm, I'm just thinking like the idea that you cannot be, you, you have to answer to being called this thing. You have to be, you have to be in a certain circumstance where you're not understood, where you can't even use the restroom. If you just think about like all of these things are, they're infuriating to us as adults, but we're adults. We're not young, you know? So I'm just thinking of if they're so demoralizing, if this is your foundation, the foundation of the world that you're growing up in, how, what precedent is, is there for one to think that there is a way to, um, to, to overcome this when we see these regressive policies really kind of, you know, being touted as ways to protect youth or address disability or what have you. It's, um, I just, you know, it's just like a big, disgusting <laughs> ball of, of, just chaos. 
Can I just piggyback on that real quick and say, I mean, as someone who is old enough to have been a trans a uh, teenager in the early to mid 2000s. And I remember all those years of Bush and Karl Rove and post 9-11. Like, I still wouldn't train being trans now for being trans then. And I do believe then at least the pessimism is partly for lack of historical memory which is due to a variety of reasons, including relatively short lifespans in the community. But point is, it does, like, I know it's kind of a Trevor Project cliche, the whole it does get better, blah, blah. But I really do firmly believe that this backlash is temporary. I realize that policy and legal-wise, some of my prayers are called Gorsuch Save Us which is a really shitty prayer to have to make. Uh, please forgive my language, but I do firmly believe that the fact that the majority of the justices that did, um, that, that did, um, I really should not be forgetting the name of this court decision, yet I am. Uh, but the point is they're still in the court and Thus, I do believe we have a, a conservative judiciary, but not a nihilistic one in that sense. Simone can disagree with me there, but uh, but there are still ways to win to an extent. But I really do believe we're just going through the equivalent of the marriage movement's version of 2004, when it was fashionable to run against it, even for Democrats and all that. And it eventually gets better. Like I do firmly believe in destiny. I'm going to go with that mantra of destiny is with us. So, yeah. Were you trying to think Bostock? Yes. That one. It just This is Simone, just sort of piggybacking on what, what you just said. Uh, I think there's a lot of cause for fear and anger and frustration and devastation, but I agree with you that there's also reason for hope and um, not, not necessarily the Supreme Court, but they have allowed some things to remain in place that were surprising. They did issue Bostock, so there, there is some hope there. But, but more importantly, I think what we see sort of historically is when it comes to marginalized communities like ours, all the ones we're talking about, when people are uninformed, when they are afraid, and they're usually afraid because they're uninformed, the public is, is more willing to allow things like this to remain in place and to happen and, and to look the other way because they genuinely don't understand. They're more likely to be swayed by misinformation and disinformation, even folks that aren't malicious and aren't transphobic or, or ableist necessarily are, are more likely to believe, you know, the, the misinformation and disinformation. And we're finally in a place where we're seeing the justifications that the states are using to oppress trans folks. We're seeing those put on trial in a way that completely dismantles them. It dismantles them in a way that doesn't allow people to actually rationally or reasonably use them as, as an argument to, to allow this oppression to stay in place. Um, and just by like way of example, you know, they're using the exact same arguments to support tr excluding trans people from bathrooms, denying them access to medically necessary, safe, effective healthcare, uh, excluding them from playing sports, uh, excluding them from you know, all sorts, any manner of things, drag shows, they're, they're banning drag shows, you know, all the things. The exact same justification that save the children, protect the children, protect girls and women from us, from our community. It, it's, it's the exact same justification repurposed and repackaged for a different argument. They said it about same-sex marriage, you know, that, that it would hurt children. They, uh, the, the Johns Committee and Anita Bryant, like none of this is new. It's all just regurgitated garbage. But what we see is that when we put their justifications on trial the way that we did with the Drew Adams case with bathrooms, what, what they did was they said, okay, 
you keep saying safety and privacy, like we need to be afraid of trans people because cis people's safety and privacy are compromised in the bathroom. But then when it finally got to trial and they looked at the entire country, the entire country, and couldn't find one instance of a trans person harming another person in the bathroom, not one instance of a cis person's privacy or safety being compromised by a, a, the existence of a trans or non-binary person in the bathroom, it makes it really hard for those people to hold on to that as their basis for you know, refusing to shift in their, their beliefs and, and thinking these things are okay. And that's what we're doing right now with these anti-trans laws is demonstrating that their justifications just don't hold up. They are not based on facts or evidence. They're based on fear and misinformation. So I do think it will get better and they will find a new target, but it's, it's devastating that there has to be a target of this like organized, coordinated, strategic I don't even know what to call what that machine is that manufactures these, these laws, but we will get past this. This is Catherine. Um, I've been a little intimidated to speak up. I feel like you all are much more experts than I am, um, but I'm definitely been nodding along and agreeing with everything that you all have been saying. Um, yeah, so my take on some of this or my thought process is that I see the statistics that um, there are, you know, more than the regular population, there's more people who are LGBTQ and disabled. And I think part of that is comes through trauma, right? Like we have certain cognitive disabilities, psychiatric disabilities that we get from being through multiple systems of oppression, but also too, and I've talked with other folks who are um, uh, queer and disabled. And I think part of it too, is that we just have a natural affinity between our two groups. And that is um, that in essence, it's just about um, honoring differences <laughs> in human experience and uh, pushing against the, um, the uh, heteronormative white male you know protestant uh fiction of what is norm right um so you know i think um you know i don't i don't think we've brought up religion yet or that we need to you know that's a whole other area but um you know i have a um a very complicated background you know i've talked about being Latina and queer and having a number of psychiatric disabilities. I'm also neurodivergent. I have ADHD. Um, I grew up with really bad OCD that related to um, uh, my upbringing in the Catholic Church. Um, and so, I mean, I hear you, Victoria, that things are getting better and I wouldn't want to live 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. But, you know, I, I also come from a community of very religious people who... Um, who um, I think we have to do a lot of work on in terms of uh, acknowledging um, that we exist, that we're not, um, uh, that we deserve rights um, in both spaces, being both disabled and queer. And I've kind of lost my train of thought, but yeah, I think um, we have a natural affinity is what I was trying to say in terms of understanding that, um, that differences do exist and that we can identify those differences within us and identify as being different from the norm. Um, and statistics to me are always kind of um, uh, not certain because I know a lot of folks who maybe if they had the resources and understanding of what um, disability is or LGBTQ identities that they may um, discover that they are, in fact, disabled and are queer. I just want to make a weird comment. If you think the New York Times coverage of trans kids is bad right now, go to the archives and read up the uh, the New York Times coverage of same-sex marriage in 2003 when Massachusetts started in, basically, because I'm old enough to have been a nerd reading that, and I was 14 at the time, so. 
it's just the same cycle of life. Humanity makes the same mistakes usually. This is Maddie. Thank you all for all of your insight into this question. And I appreciate, um, you know, the elements of hope and themes of hope kind of coming through and knowing that our communities see each other and support each other. And um, I think that's a great segue kind of into our closing um, section before we get to our plenty of wonderful participant questions. Um, and please feel free to keep sending them because we'll we'll get to them shortly. Um, but as you know, Catherine kind of said, um, talking about supporting each other and, and having shared understanding of what it means to be normal or not normal and, and how those things kind of begin to fade away, especially once you um, I begin to identify or understand how these things work in a larger context as a, a system of oppression. Um, anyways, that's all kind of to give foundation to our final few questions. Um, starting with how can the disability and LGBTQ communities work better together um, moving forward? Uh, what has this kind of looked like in the past and how can it improve? This is Catherine. I mean, for one thing, um, at least how, how we could do better on the disability side, and I'm very encouraged by everyone here, um, you know, is centering and promoting leadership by queer disabled people of color, um, centering leadership, promoting leadership by people who are multiply marginalized and just get it from their own lived experiences. That's on the disability side. And then, you know, I think that would be the same on the LGBTQ plus side as well, is making sure that they're centering leadership, um, people with lived experience with disabilities as well. I wanted to just, this is Marana Kay, echo what um, Catherine stated, because that is so true. You know, like one of, you know, when you think about the, you know, the, the, the concept of disability justice, it's 10, 10 principles and, you know, you know, the leadership of the, the most impacted and looking at all of these different intersectional issues and the different elements of who we are and, you know, kind of like cross movement, you know, solidarity and how we can help one another, the strength in numbers, like the things that we have accomplished, you know, um, the, the changes that have occurred, you know, although we know there's still a lot that needs to, to change have been because of you know coalition building because of because of working together because of seeing some of our shared needs and so i think that that is something that needs to continue to to be built and if understand that this is you know that it's you know it can be it's okay and it and not only it's okay it needs to be non-traditional it needs to be eclectic it needs to be multidisciplinary it needs to be multi-generational you know it needs to look like this and so i think that um, and that we, I think we need to give one another some grace, you know, there, you know, in Dr. Sammy Schock's book um, that came out, um, you know, about Black disability politics, it talked about how, you know, for example, you know, some elements, you know, like looking at, you know, certain communities of color and, and thinking about myself as, you know, my parents are immigrants from West Africa, um, you know, who came to this country and the concept of what, of disability in terms of, you know, like self-identification, um, as one's primary or core identity, you know, is not something that we see in all communities, but that doesn't mean that there isn't, that doesn't necessarily also mean the same as internalized ableism or shame. So I guess looking at these different shades of what things are, you know, in terms of just like a lot of these ideas and concepts are outdated in terms of transvestitism and all this ridiculous stuff, you know, like you read it and it's kind of like you roll in your eyes how, how much it doesn't apply. I think a lot of the ideas that, you know, I think a lot of the prevailing ideas surrounding disability were, had, have not been inclusive of, you know, psychiatric disability, of neurodivergence, of a lot of these other things, you know, of, you know, again, some of the acquired disabilities, you know, like long COVID. And so and something that is not, you know, as Victoria said, um, pale, male, and steel. <laughs> So I think looking at that, like if we can kind of um, 
you know, kind of try to utilize that model. Like what do our movements, do our leaders, does our leadership in these communities look like our communities? You know, are we um, amplifying the voices? People shouldn't have to have 10 million degrees behind their name to be able to come in. You know, we've got tons of, you know, as, as Catherine said, tons of learned and lived expertise, you know, brilliant voices and ideas and innovation right within our communities. And those things need to be, you know, like bolstered and to be given a platform to be able to try to, you um, help with some of the creative problem solving that we're going to need to kind of continue um, to make progress. Yeah, going back to, this is Catherine, look at me now, I'm being talkative, but, um, <laughs> you know, going back to the first question, because I'm finally caught up on the first question, you know, I think, you know, that laws um yeah laws i'll say policies too but laws and policies um are tools um but they definitely you know they're not everything and they're not sufficient and as we've kind of said we can use these tools to work in intersectional spaces but really um you know they they are um our our civil rights laws can be very one issue based um, so I think this community piece to me is the most interesting because I think that, um, the real intersectional justice works happens at a community level and, and if the tools are single issue based, then that means that each of our communities needs to rally around, um, all the issues that come up. So if there's a big LGBTQ case, the disability community has to get on board and understand that, um, that the disability community is part of the LGBTQ community and vice versa. Um, and I'll add, this is Claudia, I'll add that when we're in um, particular spaces working and it's almost any space, but I'll mention some in particular, public schools, um, public streets, <laughs> restrooms, airports, um, healthcare, 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 um, any kind of transit, jails and prisons, you know, our people are there and we need to make sure we're representing all of our people, which are going to be trans and queer people, disabled people, um, trans people who have other disabilities um, other than any gender dysphoria they may have. And so how do we um, hold all those issues when we're working in those spaces? and the workplace too. I would, uh, this is Maddie. Um, in addition to um, holding our communities for each other, is there any particular examples or ideas that um, y'all would like to share for those who um, don't hold these identities or hold one and want to do their best to support those who hold both in their community. This is Marana Kay. I would say that I, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because, you know, as as multifaceted as every last one of us is, as many different, you know, elements there as there are to our personhood, no one person is going to be, it, it, you know, it can embody um, you know, all of, you know, all communities or all issues from a personal standpoint. And, you know, allyship is important, and, but, you know, an ally is a verb. It means doing. It means taking that privilege that you have and utilizing it, not shirking in shame because you aren't being treated this way. Okay, you're not being treated this way. Good. What what doors can you open? What, you know, what causes can you champion? Um, whom can you bring along? Um, who can you speak with in your sphere of influence to kind of change, you know, make changes? Um, what internal work can you do? You know, what gradual, you know, 
changes can you make? Um, so I think that, but it's about being alongside, not being in front of, you know, I think we all have times, you know, it doesn't matter who we are, what role we play. There's times that we're in front. There's times that we're on the side. There's times that we're in the back. We need to be ready to shift and be okay with shifting, you know, um, and know that our role is important. It's not always going to be glamorous, sexy, and out front. That background work is so necessary, so important. I can't think of any movement, you know, again, our movements are strong, our communities are strong, but our allies are, you know, welcome, you know, uh, assist, you know, assistance to, you know, these things that we need to do. No one can carry, no one community or group can carry anything alone. And so I would say, learn, educate yourself. Figure things out, ask questions. Don't put that labor on other people. Learn what you can, you, you know, cause you're not gonna know and be open to continuing to learn. Be open to um, the fact that you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna bumble, you're gonna mess some stuff up. You're gonna, as, as you learn, that's part of the learning process. Find out where you can help um, and help and, you know, in a practical way um, and do so, you know, while, you know, still growing, you know, as a person, still developing yourself, you know, um, so don't wait until you've gotten to a certain point to try it. Okay, when I get this degree or when I get to this age or when I have this amount of money, we need your help now. <laughs> we need you now. Um, and so I would just encourage people to, you know, listen to those around you, um, find out how you can help, get involved, um, you know, educate yourself along the way, um, learn how you can be flexible, be re ready to adapt, you know. I think that's a fantastic answer, and I appreciate each of you providing your insight throughout this whole conversation, and we truthfully have a ton of really great questions, so um, my friends who are helping uh, feed the questions are going to um, pose a few to you now, so um, friends from DRF, if you have, if you're able to unmute and ask the first question, please do so now. Hi, Maddie, it's Robin. I'm going, going to be asking the uh, first question. Uh, it's a little long, so give me a minute. Um, how will the recent passage of Florida's Safety in Private, in Private Spaces Act impact people's ability um, slash willingness to access slash visit state-owned facilities in light of the possibility that this act, which applies to prisons, public schools, and state-owned agencies, may include restrooms and changing rooms in city parks, beaches, airports, government buildings, and education institutions. The law criminalizes the use of bathrooms and changing rooms that don't align with gender assignment at birth um, at the above state-owned facilities. Question is for people with disabilities, LGBTQ, as well as those with intersectionality to both. If these, if, uh, if these individuals do not present or identify as socially defined masculine feminine, how will this bill and the risk of confrontation slash enforcement impact their choices in employment, education, and recreation? And that's the end. Um, this is Claudia, and, and I guess we've lost um, our, our Florida legal expert, um, but I will say that um, most of us cannot avoid interacting with our government, um, and that particularly includes people with disabilities. Most people with disabilities, particularly, you know, quote unquote, significant disabilities are going to have to interact with their um, governments, and so you're essentially criminalizing someone's status um, because people have to interact with their government um, for their health care, for their disability supports, and for their education. Um, so, you know, whatever DREDF can do to help with uh, the litigation that will certainly be challenging this, you know, we're, we're you know, here.
this is Maddie. Um, if we can get a better answer for that question, we'll definitely share it out to the participants as well um, and see if Simone has additional uh, insight that she'd like to share. Um, unfortunately, she was having some Wi-Fi issues, so we hope she'll be back soon. Um, can we get the second question from our Q&A? Hi, Maddie. This is Tony, your faithful Q&A moderator. Uh, this next question asks, is there a consensus or current thought of the division between the medical and social models of disability and how LGBTQIA has also been pathologized? How do we balance the need for legal support through things like the Americans with Disabilities Act or quote special education rights versus the risks of using a medical model that's used or been used to dehumanize? Yeah, so this is Catherine. Um, I feel like this is up my alley, especially because I was sort of talking about conceptions of queerness and disability. Uh, I, I kept saying it's difference, but um, really my understanding and my belief is through a social model, right? And for those who aren't familiar, um, medical model essentially says that, that uh, the problem is internal to the individual. So if the problem is internal to the individual, then the solution is that we need to cure, fix, rehabilitate. Um, whereas a social model of disability looks external to the individual and says that uh, the problem are um, oppressive systems. And if that's the problem, then the solution is uh, fixing those oppressive systems. Um, so I think that, and, and I talk about this, I said I teach disability rights law at, law, at a law school. And we do kind of start when I teach both the ADA and the IDA, whether um, these laws are through a social model or medical model or sort of mixed. And I think in many ways, these laws, um, you know, have moved us toward the social model understanding of disability. But I do understand, and maybe this is what the question, the person asking the question is getting at, is that in many ways, um, uh, you know, a medical model understanding or the medical realm is still so prevalent in our use of disability rights protections because of, uh, you know, um, having to get, um, what's the word, like diagnoses, having to, quote unquote, like prove one's disability. So all of this sort of uh, medical um, gatekeeping that happens in order to get protections, right? So maybe that's how I'm kind of understanding um, the question. Um, uh, yeah, I'll stop there because I lost my train of thought if anyone else has any answers to this. Can you repeat the question again? In the chat. This is Maddie. I'll reread it one more time, though. The question reads, is there a consensus or current thought of the division between the medical and social model of disability and how LGBTQIA has also been pathologized? How do we balance the need for legal support through these things like the ADA or quote unquote special education rights versus the risks of using a medical model that's been used to dehumanize? Got it. I mean, yeah. to be very honest, we have the issue on the topic of gender dysphoria, for example, yeah. that maybe it is a disability in every sense of the word. Think of how uh, debilitating emotionally dysphoria can be compared to other uh, mental health issues, uh, for example, mental health disabilities. And that alone gives you a question of whether it qualifies or isn't. So I think the question is, any pathologization and the negative sense of disability is a problem for LGBT people as a whole to begin with. Because the question isn't pathologize, it's why having a medical condition is a problem to begin with. Like the whole, we're not crazy well if you work, what's the problem with them? This is Marana Kay. I just wanted to um, kind of 
add to um, what both my colleagues have shared, um, because I think that a the the stigmatization is a problem. Um, the whole oh well you know people will say well I'm this but I'm not this you know again this whole um, <laughs> you know idea of needing to um, you know pathologize or or you know uh, elevate one others or elevate oneself above someone else because of feeling of however one feels about oneself um, and the, how that just hurts groups. Um, and so it's, but I, at the same time, like even like the tension in the question I see is that, okay, there's the social model, you know, which is in terms of looking at our society overall and looking at the systems. And then there's the medical model, which is, this is, you're broken. And then like neither, neither model really, you know, captures our true reality. The social model, um, you know, cannot, it does not necessarily make um, concession for what Victoria was stating that certain things truly are, you know, truly can be, you know, very, you know, you know, disabling or, and, you know, can impact us. Um, the medical model has its place. Um, so I know that a lot of people are looking at more like the socio-ecological models or like the, you know, kind of like these interactionist models that are a bit of a hybrid of both that try to eliminate this, the stigmatizing aspect, you know, and um, affirm difference, you know, and disability as, you know, a, an inherent part of humanity as a, a way of being, um, while also addressing, you know, um, you know, needs and helping to, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, mitigate, you know, challenges or difficulties without seeing those things as um, something that some type of, you know, just, you know, flaw that cannot be, um, you know, that's just so awful or, you know, that needs to be, um, you know, stigmatized. So I think that we need the way the systems are right now. We shouldn't need a medical diagnosis to access this. Or you shouldn't need this or need this or need that. Um, unfortunately, in the world we live in, we do need those things. And so I think a lot of the, in the, in the you know, a lot of the paradigm shift until we can change that is how we view those things. You know, like a Victoria was saying, okay, so I'm not X, but why is X bad? You know, we need to fix that. Like that's something that, um, that's in something that's internal, you know, um, that, you know, is kind of sadly laden throughout society. And so I think that's an area um, in terms of the worldview that people have, our, our lens, our perspective that need, that can, that needs to be addressed. Um, more so than, um, you know, the, the realities of the interplay between medical and social. Can I say one more thing? This is Catherine. Um, so I think that the ADA and the IDA can be great tools. They're not perfect, but I think they could be good tools. Um, I think where, in the beginning, I said I work in a lot in higher education, um, and we use the ADA um, in order for folks in higher education to get accommodations. Um, and one thing that we look at is, is um, uh, you know, we have the tool to get folks accommodations, but how do we do work on the institutional level to change the stigma and perceptions of accommodations? Um, uh, for for people who still view, for example, accommodations as being like um, a, as being like a special treatment or unfair advantage or a fundamental alteration, versus um, how the disability community approaches the ADA and IDA as you know level the playing field and addressing institutional inequity, right? So um, I think. Uh, you know, we, um, I understand sort of the fear of using those tools and being pushed into a medical realm, but also I think that those tools, uh, there's a way to conceptualize them through sort of a social model, but that work needs to be done in terms of um, having people understand, um, again, that the ADA and IDA are tools for equalizing. Thank you so much for, this is Maddie. Thank you so much for that very robust answer from all of you all. Um, could we have another question from the Q&A, please? Absolutely. Hey, Maddie, it's Laura. And our third question says, I'm an intersex activist 
who works closely with the LGBTQI plus human rights movement. But the core issue impacting our intersex community is the harmful, irreversible, and medically unnecessary surgeries done on intersex infants and children. It's an issue that intersects with reproductive right, rights, children's rights, and I think disability rights, particularly around the issues of parental consents. However, here today, this panel is not even including the I when talking about LGBT. Thoughts? Thanks. So I just want to say that there is an amazing organization called Interact, uh, which focuses on intersex folks in uh, the LGBT community, and I know a few of the people involved in it, and maybe that would be a topic for another panel of that intersection. But I am, I don't dare go beyond, because I'll admit I'm not an expert, and that is admittedly not one of the big topics in this panel, one, one this set of panelists is good for. Um, this is Claudia. Um, I also am not an expert, but I think it's an incredibly important um, topic. And um, I think what would be helpful um, or might be helpful is um, to, and this is probably already being done, but for the parents of intersex kids who are supporting, you know, the right way to, to raise and care for intersex kids, which is to not do these unnecessary and harmful surgeries on infants and small children, um, for those voices to also be elevated, um, at least in our community and in, in the trans community, the support of parents have been really important. Um, and so the support of parents of intersex kids might be another um, way to try to um, get these surgeries uh, you know, stop these surgeries that are really harmful. But I also, I shared my um, email in the question and I'd be happy to talk offline about how DREDF might be supportive. Um, Thanks all. Could we please have another question from the Q&A? All right. Hi, Maddie. It's Robin again. Um, so our next question is, um, they have been able to re recycle and use the same arguments in large part because queer communities left out or kicked out trans communities throughout the years of advocacy, just as queer slash trans communities have excluded disabled people. How do we build co uh, coalitions across identity and stop that cycle. This is Catherine. I mean, I'll I'll start us off. I don't think I have the best answer, but um you know, my experience and leadership is um, what I said earlier. We need to just continue to um, make sure that we're centering and promoting leadership of people who have been excluded within these spaces. And then um, when we in our communities see or hear something problematic that we're calling out or calling in folks um, who are who are doing the who are discriminating against people within our communities or kicking out people within our communities, as your question states. Um, and I've seen this happen, um, you know, and I think we could be better at it. Um, so, yeah. This is Maddie, um, and I'm going to take off my facilitator hat for a second and put on my, uh, you know, little panelist hat for a second and add to this question as well, um, because a lot of the work that I've done has kind of 
been specifically on cross movement organizing, especially the inclusion of disabled folks within um, other communities who aren't aren't necessarily trying to exclude folks, but um, by means of not knowing about accessibility or um, you know disability inclusion and care and disability justice um, have just inadvertently or un unintentionally left disabled folks out. So I always encourage, um, I know this is coming from the disability perspective and ask for, for both, but um, I think when we're talking about advocacy, making sure that we're considering how advocacy is accessible for all folks to participate um, and in what ways they're able to participate is really, really important. Um, and as we continue to build coalitions moving forward, ensuring that um, folks with a variety of disabilities are able to show up in a way that's accessible for them um, is important, whether that's through digital organizing, um, you know, with accessibility or um, continuing to be COVID conscious as someone who has long COVID. Um, you know, a variety of things, physical accessibility, web accessibility. Um, there's a whole host of disabled um, folks who are such great resources on, on these topics. And I really encourage um, just generally uh, more accessibility and disability um, wellness centered uh, organizing and um, community building. And with that, thanks, thanks y'all for letting me jump in. <laughs> um, uh, can we have another question, please? Sure, Maddie, this is Tony. Um, thanks for your perspective just now. Um, this fifth question asks, how do we effectively address ableist intersections within LGBTQIA plus populations and communities without first discussing medical and charity models of disability and how these flawed models encourage both lateral ableism and lateral queer phobia, uh, which in turn leads to the policing of all forms of non-conforming bodies and brains. So I'm a big fan of the concept, but I'm sorry about the cat, she, you know, this Victoria, but uh, her name is Claire. Uh, but what I was going to say is that one issue that we need to keep going is the topic precisely of lateral ableism. I sometimes call it hierarchical ableism because, uh, again, it goes back to the idea of the photogenic white guy in a wheelchair as the image of what we see in the disability movement. And that leaps out all the more stigmatized disabilities around like mental health disabilities, like intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that also gives us the problem of uh, how that applies to LGBT people and how the image, I would say one, one small curse of our going mainstream and acceptance is that we created the the image that we accepted into society of the LGBT community is essentially the one that, if it were a person, would be a, pri a Bank of America pride float. And I think that is the future, the equivalent. And by the way, Catherine, I love the dog. Um, but what I would say about the future, I think that is a very likely future in trans advocacy where we end up creating sort of like we did with the marriage movement, the whole white picket fence, just like your neighbors uh, marketing something along those lines of what is, how does trans identity look within the framework of respectability politics? But yeah. Um, this is Claudia. There's something about that question that makes me think about the young adults that I know who are trans and who have disabilities and um, how they talk about their identities and their space in the world and that they take up their space, um, a lot of the young people coming up. And um, 
you know, I feel, I mean, this is again, going back to the, it might get better. Um, you know, it might get better. I feel like um, these young people are just, you know, they're not going back. And so, you know, the world is not kind, but um, they're here and they're, they're going to be trying to pull down the barriers and, and hopefully we're going to be helping them. Thank you, that's an awesome answer. Uh, could we please have the next question? Sure, Maddie. Uh, the, our next question reads, could a rights-based model more effectively frame this policy work rather than a primarily social model for disability and human rights and equity? I mean, I would say, and I think I have the question of how long, how much time are we planning to take? But I would say, we need not that, but a justice-based model, basically, where we focus on social justice. Because rights, I think of just the legal rights, basically. And that's the easy part. Getting the ink on the paper is the easy part, as with no disrespect to all my fellow lobbyists and to the litigators, for that matter, who get the law made. But the societal change that needs to come attached to them is the hard part in many ways. Yeah, I, I would, uh, this is Claudia, I tend to agree with Victoria. I think that the disability rights movement has focused on rights because we had success in rights and rights are really important. Um, and now we're here trying to think about um, uh, more about equity and um, um, access and things that cost money. And um, that means, you know, defending the Affordable Care Act and making sure that um, we people can have insurance and well, trying to strengthen it so that the insurance actually covers things. and. Yeah, so I think rights is our, at least in on the disability side, tends to be our history, and and we're trying to figure out how to broaden it. I think. I'll try to show my animal. This is Catherine. Just as an image description, my. My beagle is popped up into the screen. Sorry about that. I love beagles. I have two. I, I have a be a bigger hound, a foxhound. So like a beagle, but huge. So, but I think when I adopt again, it'll probably be a beagle. I've fallen in love with hounds, but I need it to be smaller. Uh, Claudia is showing her lab pit um, dog. Black. I love this. As we uh, pull up uh, what I think is our final question, I will let in my dog and we will ask the question. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. This is Robin. Uh, what is the current situation on diminishing disability definitions decisions under the ADA? I think that's more a question for Claudia or for the dog. <laughs> um, well, I would say, um, you know, in the disability law world, uh, you know, especially since the ADA Amendments Act of 2008, we have gotten more coverage of people as having a disability under the ADA. Um, but that doesn't mean people necessarily win their case. I think that then the battle kind of moves to the other parts of the law. So, you know, the judge might say, okay, okay, this person has a disability, but they weren't a qualified worker or they weren't a, uh, you know, that what they wanted was a fundamental alteration or it wasn't reasonable. So I think, uh, you know, we, we've managed to resolve some of the barriers for disability coverage for a, a lot of disabilities, not all of them, but a lot. Um, 
but it doesn't mean that, you know, the sort of the battle moves to the other places in the law. So for example, um, with the gender affirming care, um, you know, most of those are going under gender and not disability. Um, but then you're you're going to look at you. You have to convince the uh, the judge that it wouldn't cost too much to cover gender affirming care. Like that's where you end up. Um, but um, I think that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has tried to be um, strong on this issue, and hopefully the new regs will come out soon. Yeah, this is Catherine, and um, maybe this is not responsive to the question, but you made me think of something, Claudia, too, is um, while we do get past the first test with the amendments of more people being included, um, you know, I think specifically of people with non-apparent disabilities or like psychiatric disabilities, and in higher education for the last, you know, decade or so, um, a big issue for us is like what type of accommodations and yeah. um so that seems to be uh, uh what, what what i'm seeing are, are pushbacks on types of accommodations for people who like traditionally we didn't conceive of with the passage of the ada yeah well i believe this Sorry, this is Maddie. I believe uh, that was our final question. Um, and either way, we're kind of at time. Uh, so I wanted to take a few moment, moments to thank our panelists. Um, unfortunately, uh, Simone had some tech issues and Marini K wasn't feeling well, so they had to leave a little bit early. Um, but I appreciate all five of you for being panelists on this topic, I think, uh, you know, you all shared such important insight that I truly will help uh, people within disability rights, LGBTQ rights, organizing, activism, or just folks interested in learning about the intersection kind of get a better understanding of how this all has shaped up up until this point and where we can go moving forward. I'm going to send a quick message in the chat um, that just reads, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, this webinar has been recorded and will be available um, on our YouTube channel later this week. Additionally, after the webinar ends, um, you'll receive a survey in your email. Um, and we'd really appreciate it if you could fill it out. It just will help us understand how things went and offer you a chance to give your feedback. Lastly, if you're a person with a disability living in Florida and you feel uh, that your rights may have been violated, uh, you can apply for help from Disability Rights Florida. You can apply online at our website, which um, if one of the other DRF folks can put that in the chat, at disabilityrightsflorida.org, or you can call us at 1-800-342-0823. And thank you all so much for uh, being here this evening. Um, yeah, I appreciate everybody and hope you have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.